The Light Princess, Part 7 The princess's pleasure in the lake had grown to a passion and she could scarcely bear to be out of it for an hour. Imagine then her consternation when diving with the prince one night, a sudden suspicion seized her that the lake was not so deep as it used to be. The prince could not imagine what had happened. She shot to the surface and without a word swam at full speed towards the higher side of the lake. He followed, begging to know if she was ill or what was the matter. She never turned her head or took the smallest notice of his question. Arrived at the shore, she coasted the rocks with minute inspection. But she was not able to come to a conclusion, for the moon was very small, so she could not see well. She turned, therefore, and swam home, without saying a word to explain her conduct to the prince, of whose presence she seemed no longer conscious. He withdrew to his cave, in great perplexity and distress. Next day she made many observations, which, alas, strengthened her fears. She saw that the banks were too dry, and that the grass on the shore and the trailing plants on the rocks were withering away. She caused marks to be made along the borders and examined them day after day in all directions of the wind, till at last the horrible idea became a certain fact. The surface of the lake was slowly sinking. The poor princess nearly went out of the little mind she had. It was awful to her to see the lake, which she loved more than any living thing, lie dying before her eyes. It sank away, slowly vanishing. The tops of rocks that had never been seen till now began to appear far down in the clear water, and before long they were dry in the sun. It was fearful to think of the mud that would soon lie there, baking and festering, full of lovely creatures dying and ugly creatures coming to life, like the unmaking of a world and how hot the sun would be without any lake. She could not bear to swim in it any more, and began to pine away. Her life seemed bound up with it, and ever as the lake sank, she pined. People said she would not live an hour after the lake was gone. But she never cried. A proclamation was made to all the kingdom, that whosoever should discover the cause of the lake's decrease would be rewarded after a princely fashion, Humdrum and Copykeck applied themselves to their physics and metaphysics, but in vain. Not even they could suggest a cause. Now the fact was that the old princess was at the root of the mischief. When she heard that her niece found more pleasure in the water than anyone else out of it, she went into a rage and cursed herself for her want of foresight. But, she said, I will soon set it right. The king and the people should die of thirst. Their brains shall boil and frizzle in their skulls before I lose my revenge. And she laughed a ferocious laugh that made the hairs on the back of her black cat stand erect with terror. Then she went to an old chest in the room and opening it took out what looked like a piece of dried seaweed. This she threw into a tub of water and then she threw some powder into the water and stirred it with her bare arm, muttering over it words of hideous sound and yet more hideous import. Then she set the tub aside and took from the chest a huge bunch of a hundred rusty keys that clattered in her shaking hands. She sat down and proceeded to oil them all. Before she had finished, out from the tub, the water of which had kept on a slow motion ever since she ceased stirring it, came the head and half the body of a huge grey snake. But the witch did not look round. It grew out of the tub waving itself backwards and forwards with a slow horizontal motion till it reached the princess when it laid its head upon her shoulder and gave a low hiss in her ear. She started but with joy and seeing the head resting on her shoulder drew it towards her and kissed it. Then she drew it all out of the tub and wound it round her body. It was one of those dreadful creatures which few have ever beheld. The white snakes of darkness. Then she took the keys and went down to her cellar, and as she unlocked the door, she said to herself, This is worth living for. Locking the door behind her, she descended a few steps into the cellar, and crossing it, unlocked another door into a dark, narrow passage. She locked this also behind her, and descended a few more steps. If anyone had followed the witch princess, 
he would have heard her unlock exactly 100 doors and descends a few steps after unlocking each. When she had unlocked the last, she entered a vast cave, the roof of which was supported by huge natural pillars of rock. Now this roof was the underside of the bottom of the lake. She then untwined the snake from her body and held it by the tail high above her. The hideous creature stretched up its head towards the roof of the cavern, which it was just able to reach. It then began to move its head backwards and forwards with a slow oscillating motion, as if looking for something. At the same moment, the witch began to walk round and round the cavern, coming nearer to the centre with every circuit, while the head of the snake described the same path over the roof that kept she did over the floor for she kept holding it up, and still it kept slowly oscillating. Round and round the cavern they went, ever lessening the circuit, till at last the snake made a sudden dart and clung to the roof with its mouth. That's right, my beauty, cried the princess. Drain it dry. And she let it go, left it hanging, and sat down on a great stone with her black cat, which had followed her all around the cave by her side. Then she began to knit and mutter awful words. The snake hung like a huge leech, sucking at the stone. The cat stood with his back arched, and his tail was like a piece of cable, looking up at the snake. And the old woman sat and knitted and muttered. Seven days and seven nights they remained thus, when suddenly the serpent dropped from the roof as if exhausted, and shriveled up till it was again like a piece of dried seaweed. The witch started to her feet, picked it up and put it in her pocket. She looked up at the roof. One drop of water was trembling on the spot where the snake had been sucking. As soon as she saw that, she turned and fled, followed by her cat. Shutting the door in a terrible hurry, she locked it, and having muttered some frightful words, sped to the next, which also she locked and muttered over, and so with all the hundred doors, till she arrived in her own cellar. Then she sat down on the floor ready to faint, but listening with malicious delight to the rushing of the water, which she could hear distinctly through all the hundred doors. But this was not enough. Now that she had tasted revenge, she lost her patience. Without further measures, the lake would be too long in disappearing. So the next night, with the last shred of the dying old moon rising, she took some of the water in which she had revived the snake, put it in a bottle and set out, accompanied by her cat. Before morning, she had made the entire circuit of the lake, muttering fearful words as she crossed every stream and casting into it some of the water out of the bottle. When she had finished the circuit, she muttered yet again and flung a handful of water towards the moon. Thereupon every spring in the country ceased to throb and bubble, dying away like the pulse of a dying man. The next day there was no sound of falling water to be heard along the borders of the lake. The very courses were dry, and the mountains showed no silvery streaks down their dark sides, and not alone had the fountains of Mother Earth ceased to flow. For all the babies throughout the country were crying dreadfully without tears.